Well, take your Bible. We're going to finish the book of Philippians today. Philippians chapter 4, we finish. And what does Philippians have to do with Christmas? Because everybody came to church for a Christmas story today. And if you would have come to Sunday school, you would have got one. Uh, but you skipped Sunday school, so you didn't get the Christmas story. We're going to, it ended amazing that the Christmas story is all the way throughout the whole Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, the Christmas story is there. The story of Christ, I should say, is there. So the joy of giving is today's sermon title. I want you to see some things. It's kind of amazing. When, you, when you're faced with facts, what do we do as humans? Like we just about poinsettias as a poinsettia is. What do we do with facts many times? If you were trained a certain way or you believed something for many years, I'm 50 years old and just found out it's called poinsettia, for real. I never looked it up, never cared, because I called it poinsettia, and that's what it was, because everybody around me called it poinsettia. Mom, what would you call those things? Poinsettia? Yeah, that's where I got it from, my mother. All right, poinsettias. But we learn culture, we learn things in our life that, that maybe we, uh, we, that's the way I learned it, and you won't change. We talked about angels a little bit this morning as well, we talked about those here. Most of us had those, uh, we, I know when we were kids, we had one at some point, our grandmother did, this big old massive woman with a flowing gown, and she had big wings, and she had blonde hair. And if in, in the Bible, so I looked through and just happened to be looking at Christmas story, trying to find that being in the Bible. Well, that being is, that being is found in Zechariah chapter 5, beginning in verse 5, and that there's two of them, there's two women with wings like a stork, there's big wings, and they, they actually are carrying the basket full of wickedness to the place of wickedness those winged creatures a woman with flowing wings and blonde hair or red hair whatever the we've, we've seen in your picture of christmas and they're in all the picture bibles only place in the bible you'll find those creatures is there in zechariah chapter 5 verse 5 and on where the prophet's having a vision and an angel of god is actually telling him what he's looking at he says what am i looking at and he's looking at a woman who's put in a basket and she's called wickedness, and a, lead, a lid is put over top of her, and the two winged creatures come and carry the basket away to build a throne for it in the place of Shinar or Babylon, the place of wickedness. Anytime you see in Scripture, Shinar or Babylon is reference to uh, wickedness. So those beings that we've seen as kids and we see and even in Bible stories or we see all over town, those beings are only found in the Bible in that one place, and they're a picture of demons. You say, well, Pastor, I just, just like the point said it to me, right? You come up and just show that. Look for yourself. Every time that you see an angel appear to a man in the Bible, he appears as a masculine sense. Michael, the archangel, right? Lucifer, when he was first created. Gabriel, we'll see him talk to Mary. Those are actually masculine sense. Every time that we talk about God the Father, we always reference him as how? He. Every time we reference to Jesus Christ, it's always he. And the Holy Spirit he works within us. He. It's always a reference to the masculine sense. Not that they're men, but the masculine sense. Now, if that messes up your Christmas, we didn't want to mess up your Christmas with poinsettias or poinsettias or even that image. We don't want to mess your Christmas up, but we do want our Christmas to be biblical. Is that true? Don't you want to be as close to the Christmas story, the birth of Christ, as we can be? Even Christmas itself, it's not a celebrated uh, holiday. Jesus, it wouldn't call it Christmas when he was born. That comes later. But it comes to a point that we represent the Lord Jesus Christ, and we speak something in error. If we do it unknowingly, that call, then we're called what? Ignorant, right? Ignorant, that's true. Thank you, Mark. If we do it in error, we do, it's because we're ignorant, we didn't know. When I was in the military, I was flying to, uh, to Spain, and what do people in Spain look like? Who's ever been to Spain? Anyone ever been to Spain? All right, don't answer the question. What do people in Spain look like? Anybody want to take a guess? Especially Madrid, Spain. That's where I was going. They would be Spanish, dark hair, dark eyes, olive skin, right? And, you think, and I thought of everything I've ever learned was matadors. People would be running from bulls because I was limited in my knowledge when I got there. And I, I got to Madrid, and guess what I found? Blonde hair, blue eyes, red hair, dark skin, dark eyes, dark skin. People of every stripe were there in Madrid. My ignorance of being there was just that ignorance. But when I got there, guess what happened? When I saw the truth, it was revealed to me what actually was there. Now, there's a predominance of a one, a people group there. There's a predominant look, but same token, when I was a child, everything that you read or see, and now the Internet's let people go anywhere, you, you have a picture or stereotype or whatever it might be of a story, of a flower, of a people group, whatever it might be. Even about when we say giving, how many of you guys have ever heard all that church talks about is giving, giving, giving? They said that about a lot of churches many times. 
And usually the person who quotes that, if they say all churches talk about is giving, are usually doing what? Not giving. Because if you go to the movie theater, when you buy your ticket, what does your ticket pay for? Do you know? If you go to the movies. Your, your ticket pays for what? Pays for the light bill. It pays for the guy who got your popcorn. A uh, girl who got your popcorn. It pays for the seat that you're sitting in that reclines all the way back. One small piece of that ticket sale goes to a lot of different things, not just the movie that you're going to see. Even people that are pagans come into a place that's beautiful as this place understand there's a cost associated with it. Now, I told you as a pastor, I don't believe God ever intended for us to build buildings like this. I don't think God ever intended for us to build have these massive parking lots and all this beautiful stuff that we have. The church obviously is a place to worship God, but most in the New Testament, they were actually serving in small areas. Now, you'll find they're excavating now in Turkey. They're finding the seven churches that were written to in Turkey. They're finding their ruins. There's a place to gather. I believe that. But as we do gather, and we're Americans, we gather, we understand most people come indoors to worship today because Town Creek, when it was started, it was started as a brush arbor. They met under some lean-tos, if you will. They actually leaned trees together, and that probably wouldn't be very good today uh, to be outside under a lean-to, would it? I mean, most people come indoors because we want it heated or air-conditioned. And, and that's understandable. That's our culture. But I'm saying when the church started, there was not the beautiful beautification like that we have today. We're grateful for what we have, but we understand God's provided a place for us to worship him, but he's also provided the avenue for us to go out and lead others to Christ. So today we're talking about the joy of giving. Paul's going to write, we're going to pick up in verse, let's go back to verse 8 if we could. We're going to pick up in verse 10. But verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever things are true. And by the way, these things God tells us to be like. When you think of true, what is another word with true? It's truth, right? Jesus said, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So listen to these words that see if they describe to you the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, was Christ noble? Whatever things are just, was he just? Whatever things are pure, was he pure? Whatever things are lovely, was he lovely? Whatever things are of good report, was he of a good report? If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What is he, Paul's trying to tell the church to actually what? Be like Christ Jesus. That's exactly what he's talking about here. The things which you've learned and received and heard of and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Last week we talked about God's going to be with you. And his peace will be with you because when you give your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, not only does he slide off, he don't just like cut you off a piece of beef. Like you've ever been to a, a nice uh, banquet and they, you're standing there before the roast or whatever it might be. And you'll say, medium rare, what temperature, or whatever, what, what, is it, what, yeah, what temperature would you like? And they'll slice off whatever, whatever slice of meat that you like, and then you take that and you're, you're excited. That's not how God works. He doesn't slice off a piece of peace to give to you. The Bible says he gives you himself, and his title is called what? The Prince of Peace, right? He's God. Isaiah 9, 6, if you're taking notes, go back and look. He shall be called the Prince of Peace. So this peace, when God says, and the God of peace will be with you, who does he send? The Lord Jesus Christ has ascended back to heaven. But in Christ, representing Christ, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. You and me have the Holy Spirit. I have God living inside of me right now. The Bible says he's in me and he's around me because I have given my heart and life to him. He's with me. That's why Jesus warns us, be careful what you go and see. Be careful what you say because you're taking the Holy Spirit. You're taking God with you. Do you understand that? Remember when we were little, maybe with some of you sang it, we sang it, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you, come on, help me out. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, for the Father up above is looking down in love, so be careful, little eyes, what you see. And we would talk about our ears and our hands and our feet and things that we would do. We were careful to remind the children, don't do the things that the world's doing because you're carrying Christ with you, and God is always watching. Well, let's continue to go. Watch this. I want you to see this as we read. Verse 10, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did, not, did, uh, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Does that describe American Christians today? Are we content? The Christmas season's on upon us and People are swiping credit cards left and right, trying to buy stuff that people really don't want. And uh, 
it's going to pile up in the garage and be a nuisance or go to the self-storage. Toys, kids got to have the latest toys, and there's thousands and thousands of dollars of toys in the toy box at home. Is that true? Grandma gives toys. Grandpa gives toys. Aunts and uncles give toys. It's just we give, 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 give. Why? Is it because we have a need or is it because we have a want? And sometimes it's not even a want. We don't even want it. Some people are so bodacious today to say, can I, you give me the gift receipt with that so I can take it back? And what do they want? The cash so I can go buy something that I do want, not to give it away. I'd like to give this away to someone else. How about that? Is that a novel thought? If you receive something that you really don't want or don't need, to actually turn back around and give it to someone who is in need? Is that a novel thought for this time of year? It is. Listen, this comes to the place. It comes from Christ. This is what Paul is saying. Listen, I'm rejoicing in the Lord greatly, greatly, because he's already told us about the church giving him a gift. But there's something unique about this. Go to verse 12 with me. He says, I know how to be abased. That means poor. I'm at the bottom. And I know how to be abound, how to abound. That means I've, I've walked with the, the upper crust of society. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. Paul says, I've been at the lowest point of human life, and I've been at the highest point. And he has. We know that he was a Pharisee. So he, had to, he basically was rolling in the cash when he was a Pharisee before Christ. His family had to be of a good report because he was a Roman citizen. He was a Jewish man that was a Roman citizen. So he had, he had to have money in the family. His family had to have money. And he was a Pharisee. He was a ruler. He was a, one of the top men, the religious. He was a politician as well. He was one of the top men of his time. Even though he was young, he was zealous to persecute the church of God. And then when he becomes a Christian, what happens? He loses everything, status. He loses his place in society. He loses everything for the sake of Christ. He loses literally everything. He has to actually, he preaches some, and then he sews tents. The Bible calls him a tent maker. He actually worked with his hands because he obviously learned something. He learned to trade. He would preach and he would sew. He was trying to make enough money to live and eat so that he can keep on keeping on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he actually put his hands to the work. Then he comes up, verse 13, probably one of the most misquoted verses of all time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Most baseball players say this before they, knock a, they want to knock a home run or they want to score a touchdown if you're in football or whatever it might be. We always put that. That's usually on their shoes or somewhere. Or some, some athlete puts that out there. But most professional athletes have no clue what that means, right, until they're professional. He's saying, listen, I can do all things through Christ. Whether I'm at the lowest or I'm at the highest, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not winning the goal or shooting the basket or whatever it might be. That's living life and being content in life. If I don't have any food today, guess what I won't do? I won't eat today, but I'll praise God. But if I'm at a banquet, guess what I'll do? I'll eat till my heart is full, until my stomach's full, and I'll praise God. That's what he's trying to tell us. I can do all things. I can be down here with, I can be with these people who have nothing, or I can be up here with these people who have everything, or I can be anywhere in between. I've learned wherever I am in life, I'm content. Paul told Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Think about that. Thinking about being content this season that we're in. He goes on in verse 14, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. This is one of his low times. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, there was a church there also, no church, not one church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only, only the church at Philippi, which was a very, if you would call them a poorer church. They're smaller and a poorer church. He's like, no church helped me but you guys. Keep going, watch what happens. For even in Thessalonica, he, tra- he changes cities. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. You met my need. Not that I seek the gift, I wasn't looking for it, but what happened? I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Feed the preacher, what should the preacher do? If you feed the preacher, what should the preacher do? Yes, thank you, of course, but what should he do? He should preach. Feed the teacher, what should she do? Teach. Do you understand what the concept? That's how Southern Baptists created it. You see in your, your bolt of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and the gifts that we give. We give so that people will go and preach the gospel so they don't have to come home and say, would you give me $5? 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 Because if a missionary comes, if my, let's take McKenzie for example. If McKenzie came to each one of you and said, hey, we really have this project and it's going to cost about $500, 
And she went to every one of you and said, hey, would you, could you spare $5 for us to get this project done? I would tell you, I believe, I know most of you in the room, that you would say, absolutely, Mackenzie, I would give you $5. Because it's a mission. We understand where it's going. So, yeah, if it's, if it's a mission for overseas, I'm giving. But when the Lord tells us to give out of our abundance, and what do we give? Listen, we talk about tithing. And listen, somebody told me not long ago, tithing is not biblical. Well, where do we find the word tithing? In the Bible. Does that make it biblical? Absolutely, 100% tithing is biblical. Abraham, all the way back to Old Testament, when he had success, he gave the Lord 10% of everything that he had. And what do we do today? Could you imagine if there was a rule that you had to give 10%? If there was just this flat-out rule, what would we do? Less people would be Christians, right? There's a church that I've heard of that actually prints people's giving in the bulletin. So everybody knows who gives what. That's absolutely not the way, is it? Because your prayer life is between who? You and God. And also with your children, by the way, your family, because you men, we are the spiritual leaders of our household. But your giving's between who? You and God. Your Bible study, who is it between? You and God and those you might share with. But everything in the Christian life, everything in the Christian life is between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've done it, and George, was our, he was our finance guy way back in the day. Seems like it's been so long, George, we get, we're getting older. But I started saying, listen, we would send something. No one got a giving statement. I believe, I was challenged when I became a Christian to start giving and watch the Lord work. And church, listen, I'm going to challenge you today, this Christmas season, start financially giving to the Lord's work and watch Him work. Some of you can't. My life is miserable. I don't know why things are happening to us. I don't know why everything's falling apart. It's because, listen, you're not in lockstep with the Lord Jesus Christ. In your giving, in your praying, in your Bible study, listen, a Christian has duties that we're responsible for. Is that true? And we don't want to talk about it because we say all the church talks about is giving. That is not what we're talking about, but that is what we do. We just sang We Three Kings. Not one of my favorite songs of all time. Because I believe there's more like 300 people that came to town. Because the kings have had gold, the, the wise men, they would have had somebody to protect the gold. Right? They would have had somebody to feed the camels, their transportation. Somebody would cook. They would have had all the servants they would have had. It was a big clank coming to town. It would be like, if you would, Donald Trump rolling up coming to church today. The black, all the escalades coming in, everything that's coming in, we would go, what is going on? I was talking about it when the city of Aiken, when a police car goes by, everybody goes, somebody did something wrong. But when about 10 of the city of Aiken patrol cars go by with lights, what do we say? Something's going on, right? You've been there, you turn the scanners on or you try to find out, Facebook lights up, everybody's trying to find out what's going on. Same thing happens when Herod was around, there was this entourage that come to town. Because if they, they were from Babylon, they're from, or from the east, and we think Babylon, they were from the east. What would you do to the, that's the enemy of the people of Jerusalem. What would you do if the enemy sent three guys to town? You would think they're spying on you, wouldn't you? And you would do what with them? If you were Herod, Herod killed his own sons. This man was a maniac. You would lock them up in prison. You would lock them up, and you would, or you would execute them thinking they're spies. But if 300 come to town, there's no way to lock them up. Something's going on. Who are you looking for? We're looking for the king of the Jews. Bring all the scribes and Pharisees. Yo, yo, all the guys, all the scribes come in. Where is he to be born, this king of the Jews? They go, hmm, let's search the scriptures. They went back and opened up. Micah says, let's see, he said several hundred years ago, he's supposed to be born in the city of Bethlehem. Here it tells the Magi, listen, go look for the child. And when you find him, bring me word because I want to worship him too. Now we know, he, what did he want to do? He wanted to kill him. But because he kills every male child two years and under because he felt like he was tricked. So we can read the story. This is not a very good PG story. It's a PG-13 story. But now we come back and I want to tie the Magi into what we're talking about today. Paul's talking about helping, listen, and he used accounting terms. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your, here's an accounting term, to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Aphrodite, that was the minister who actually took the, the resources, that was the church treasurer, if you will, and the carrier. The thing sent from you, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. Verse 19, this applies back to the church it gave. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. Remember, Paul's in prison, 
in Rome. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are in the household of Caesar. Now, Paul wanted to reach Rome, didn't he? If he would have been preaching on the street, they would have just ignored him. But where is Paul? He's locked by a Roman guard, and he's told him about Jesus. And when the shift changes, guess what? He's told him about Jesus when they bring his food. He's told him about Jesus. Every time that Paul has an opportunity, what is he doing? He's preaching the gospel every chance he gets, even locked in prison. And he says, the household of Caesar greets you. He even comes into place, the, the saints in the household of Caesar. Verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So let me show you this. Kids say it today. I don't know where it come from. And I hope I'm not quoting something inappropriate, but it's true. First thing is giving demonstrates care. Kids say today, sharing is caring. I don't know where that comes from. Is that a Care Bear saying? But sharing is caring, right? When I share something with you, if I have a sandwich and cut it in half, guess what happens? It shows that I care. Me and Mr. Mike share lunch all the time. We just brought, me and Mr. Griffin, we, hey, I'm going to get something to eat. Or none of us bring lunch. We're never organized enough to actually get our lunches in order. Well, he brings them more because his wife is here, but we're just not in order with that kind of stuff. And sometimes Mike brings leftovers. I never want his stuff because he gives me his leftovers like three days later. Uh, but we do tear sandwiches open. We eat fruit. Whatever's available, we just, we just share. We, we split it. Well, what's this? In verse 10, it tells us very clearly, Christians are motivated to give every chance offered. Look at verse 10 if you don't see that. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. You've given to me again. Though you surely did, not, uh, did, did care, but you lacked opportunity. Sometimes people ask me, Pastor, what can I give towards? I'd like to help a family in need at Christmas. Every time, let me tell you, 100% of the time, this is how God works out. It's usually the gift comes in first, and then the need comes in second. It hardly ever. I mean, it's like in my life it's happened, but here at church, as long as I've been the pastor, people have a need, the need, let's pray about it. What is the, let's, I'll pray with you, I'll join with you about praying, especially if it's a vehicle, if it's a car, if it's a truck, if it's a motorcycle, maybe not a motorcycle, but unless you want to transport, if it's food, if it's an electricity bill, if it's clothing, if it's a burnout, whatever it might be, I will join with you and pray for whatever God wants in your life. I'll pray specifically. What do you want? What, what is it the need? And I'm telling you, God meets that need specifically, because I learned a long time ago, specific prayers get specific answers and general prayers get general answers god bless me okay take a deep breath there's your blessing prayer answer right what do you need what is something that's on your heart and the bible even says in psalm 37 if you take note if you delight yourself in the lord he'll give you the desires of your heart what are your desires what are you after if it's stuff that's not delighting yourself in the lord if you chase stuff all the time a bigger house a better car than the one you have because it's newer or newer style, you're always going to be losing. You're never going to win. And you're always going to be disenfranchised. And can you imagine one day you're going to die and facing the Lord Jesus Christ saying, but Lord, I was never satisfied. You didn't bring enough contentment in my life. And he's going to tell us we're looking in the wrong places. There's rewards in heaven. Hold your place and go with me to 2 Corinthians. I want you to see this about giving. When Paul says, Paul says over and over again, this says something about your giving, your financially giving to the Lord. Paul talks about what we're giving, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. When you're there, say amen. This matters, church. Listen, this is not just a, hey, give more so we can actually be, sorry, I was distracted. I saw deer run by the, <laughs> out the window out there. I didn't know what that was. Good grief. Anyway, the, um, the cheerful giver, watch this what the Lord says. This is not a sermon of give more money because we've we got to have more money. We don't. i got to tell you before I read this, God has met all of our needs according to his riches and glory, this church. With the school, with the preschool, with the church, God has met every need. This church, 10 years ago, just about a little bit 11 years ago, the older members can tell you, was almost in foreclosure. The bank was calling for the title of this church and this property. They were asking for it. The Bank of the West was calling this property back into to account. As the Lord would have it, for the last 10 years, we've been in the black. God's seen to it, the people's giving and, and tuitions, all different things that come in. Everything that has gone out has come back in. Our budget went up last year, or the year before last, over a million dollars in one year. Now, if I would have thought about it, I would have passed out. It's hard to write. I've got to write million backwards. I've got to start with the zeros and put the commas in. Just because how can God do that with Town Creek? How? 
And if God's in it, church, I want to tell you, listen, he's blessing every single thing. You're going to see that. He blesses everything that we're into. Look at, look at the Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. And it's, if he leads it, he's in it. I should say that. With this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap what? Sparingly. Do you all understand this is a gardening term? Okay. And he who sows bountifully will also reap what? Do you know there's no age limit on this? If you're a teenager and got a job at McDonald's, this applies to you. If you cut grass, if you, if you trim hedges, if you rake leaves right now, I used to do it. If you drag it and you make $15, listen, I believe the Lord. It all belongs to him. It's not hard to give the Lord a dollar when you're making 10. But it sure is hard when you start making 50000 to give him 5000 isn't it? Isn't it crazy? The more money we make, the harder it is to give it away. Because we still start thinking, I've earned it, I deserve it. And the answer is you haven't necessarily earned it, he's given it to you. It's his gift, right? I'll show you that in just a moment. But we'll go quickly. Verse 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Can you imagine this? Lord, I purpose in my heart before God and the witnesses to give nothing to your work. Does that sound awesome? Lord, please allow me, bless, bless my giving. I'm giving zero to the Lord's work at Town Creek Baptist Church. That don't sit right, does it? I see some frumpy faces. I'm not trying to make you frumpy. I'm not trying to make you a friend. I'm trying to tell you, I want to help you because, listen, church, listen, this is, a, this, is a, this is not a get rich, hey, let's get more for the pastor. This is not it ever is. This is actually, if we were paid off every bill 100%, I wrote a book that I would get all the royalties and I'm obviously my, my salary is paid through the royalties. We owe no debt whatsoever. Would we still be motivated to give? Absolutely, because we're Christians and that we give back. We've done this. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, church, we said that he said this in Philippians, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have in sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. What is God going to give you every time that you give it away? He's going to give you more. You can never outgive God. If you back it up, dump and dump truckloads of cash to the Lord's work, listen, he's going to bring semi-trailers to your way. When you start loading up the semi-trailers and dumping it in the Lord's, he's going to start bringing the trains. You can never outgive God. Amen? That's a good place for amen. If you've, been, if you've been given, you know that he supplies all of your need according to the riches, his riches in glory. Take this example. Go back to the We Three Kings or We Three Wise Men. Where do we think they come from? I gave the secret away just a little bit ago. We know it's from the east, but from the city of where? Potentially Babylon. Not the most spiritual place on the planet. Would you agree? Even to this day. But they brought three gifts. And those three gifts actually are still used today. We still, they're still around today. But these gifts were good in Babylon. And where did they bring these three gifts? Where did they bring them to? Oh, it's a Christmas story. Where'd they bring them? They tracked that gold and frankincense and myrrh all the way across the deserts and brought them over to the town of Bethlehem. And then Joseph and Mary, they get into place. And what happens when, the, when they get there? Let's have a look just so you'll see for yourself. So you're not, not thinking I'm just making this up. So we, oh, pastor, let's give, so we make everybody give more money. Listen to what he says. Look at Matthew chapter 2. Hurry, go there, Matthew chapter 2. You need to see this. This is so awesome. Because sometimes you'll miss it. Like Mike said, we'll read this over and over again and won't process through this. Matthew chapter 2. This is awesome stuff. Matthew 2. And most people believe, most scholars believe, these men were trained from the lineage of Daniel. When Daniel would teach the next class and the next class, and they'd pass it on, look for the star. The star's going to point out the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Look for the star. And they trained in the stars. These were men who studied the stars. And watch what happens. Let's go to verse 7. Here they come to town. In chapter 2, verse 7, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, he determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to what city? Bethlehem. Why did, how did Herod know it was Bethlehem? Because all the knucklehead preachers told him so, right? All the ones who were supposed to know, the religious men, told him where it was going to go. It should say in the Bible, it should say, All the wise men and all the scribes and all the Pharisees and everyone who believed in the, that the Messiah was coming, they beat a path to Bethlehem. That's what it should say, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it, church? Could you imagine, we talked about this morning, if Jesus was in New Elton and we got word that, hey, Jesus is in New Elton, would any of us go to New Elton this morning? 
I would encourage you to walk out of church and go to New Elton Day if Jesus was there. The shepherds went. They heard what they do. These are lowly nobodies. They heard that Jesus was born, the Messiah was born, and the Bible says they got up and they went. They believed. And when they come back, they're telling the story. Hey, you won't believe. We've saw, we saw, we, with our own eyes, we actually have encountered the Messiah. Well, here goes the Magi, the, Magi, the wise men. Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And they throw him a couple coins of gold and they leave. Is that what it says? It's not what they did. What's the gold for? The gold is reserved for Jesus, the king. He was called the king of the Jews. You know Herod used that title, by the way? He called himself the king of the Jews. So the gold was for the king of the Jews. But they didn't give him any that were told or reported. Why? Because this was reserved for the true king. You can't have any of this because it's the king. So he could have he taxed them. He could have, I'm sure his army was bigger than whatever they brought in. He could have overwhelmed them and taken their gifts. Watch what happens. When they heard the king, in verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which had... Uh, they had seen in the east went before them till it came over and stood where the young child was. When they saw the star, they did what? Could you imagine coming to church rejoicing exceedingly with joy, great joy? How many of y'all walked in church this morning? We're going to talk about Jesus today. We get to open our Bibles in our own language. We get to sing songs to the Lord Jesus Christ in freedom. Most people come in talking about the game, talking about Christmas bills. Is there any church coffee? We need to get better coffee. Is there any donuts this morning? We need to do all the, it was all about me and we. Is that true? You should be walking in those doors when you come in. I can't wait to get with God's people and worship the one true God. I'm coming to rejoice. I get a chance to actually tell God, I love you. I get a chance to be part of a baptism. You guys worship something that there's life change that just happened this morning. We get to see that of our own accord. We get to actually see it with our own eyes. No one had to tell us about it after church. There's churches that now praise the Lord, our baptisms, but there's churches that haven't baptized anybody in 10 or 15 years. We must be telling people the story of Jesus. Is that true? And every time there's a, there's a baptism, every first Sunday we do the Lord's Supper, it should be a joyful occasion that we get a chance that the Lord bless us enough to come to this place to worship Him. We should get a little bit excited, church. Here, here they are. These are grown men. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down. And what did they do? What does your Bible say? They worshiped him. Could you imagine if we get on our knees in a worship service? What would happen if we all get down like this, we get ready to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, and you come into his presence with thanksgiving and worship? Would you think somebody's weird when they're on their knees? Would you think so? We're like, that ain't how we do it around here. That's how they did it when they first encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they would go even further sometimes to get on their face. If you get before the Lord and get serious with the Lord, you'll start realizing how small you are and how great he is. He'll drive you to your knees and he'll drive you to your face saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Watch what they do. They worship him and when they open up their treasures, they said, sorry, Lord, we stopped by Outback on the way here and we kind of, we kind of, you know, it's like $70 for the bill and Lord, we kind of did this. We, we got, my, my grandkid really needs this gift and Lord, I took a little bit of that out and Lord, I just, uh, I need a gas in the car and I took a little bit of that out and we only have like a couple pennies left for you. Is that what they did? They had preserved God's gift for God. We as Americans today, we reserve God's gift for us and our appetites. We spend more money, we tip more money in the typical Baptist church. We tip the waitress more money than we give to the Lord Jesus Christ's work. And we say, Lord, bless it. That's a good place for an amen right there because if you know what's giving, what happens? We give more to our stomach and more to our cars. We have 70, 80, 90,000 dollar cars in the parking lot and some people won't give one dollar to the Lord's work. God forbid that you don't participate in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. God forbid that you were here. Listen, you might have even been a servant. Did the servants participate in this gift? Yes, because they were doing everything they could to make these magi. They were talking about along the way. They were listening to them. Listen, we're going to worship Jesus, the Messiah. We're going to worship the King of Kings. We're taking these gifts. And listen, I can't help but think, but they were watering those camels as fast as they could. Let's, hey, let's rest well. Tomorrow we're traveling. Let's get to the place where we get to see the King. 
So the poorest that were with them to the richest got to see the king. And when they opened up the gifts, listen, that gift, yeah, was given from the Magi. But listen, everybody on the party got to send them, right? They were all part of it. They helped them. They helped the gift get there. Watch what they do. And when they opened up their treasures, they presented gifts of, to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. You keep reading, and then what, do, what does Mary and Joseph now have? They have resources, just like Paul talked about. Listen, I rejoiced greatly that you guys provided for my need. Are Mary and Joseph in their hometown? The answer is no. Joseph's a carpenter. He works with his hands. When you, when you say, if you own your own business and it says, hey, we're closed for the holidays, guess what you don't get? Money. You don't make any money. And when you're out of town and away from your business, he had to hang a shingle, and he's far from his place. Then he stays there a couple years, and then he's sent down to Egypt. But well, how in the world did they get the money for Egypt? They traded a little bit of gold, maybe sold frankincense, because people still buried this way. Everybody needed this commodity, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When the people of God, because they worshiped him, that's why we know they were people of God, when the people of God give gifts to God, those gifts turn back around and now multiplied and sent back out to bless other people. Do you think they told the story as they went? Do you think Jesus was there with them every, t- every step of the way telling the story? Yeah, Paul is telling the story. And that's where he says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So let me get through this really quick. God demonstrates care. Sharing is caring. Christians are motivated to give every chance offered. You say, well, I don't have much money. The widow who gave two pennies in the Bible, Jesus said she gave more than everybody. He was watching the giving. She gave two pennies in the Bible. These people are dropping gold coins. And he says the woman, the widow that gave two pennies, two, listen, those two small coins, it wouldn't even equal to pennies. She gave more than everybody in the place. Because what is God looking at? Not the amount of money. Does he need the money? Does God need your money? Go to John chapter 1, if you would, really quick, please. You need to see this. See this for yourself. Everybody in the room, go to John 1. Some of you are hardcore, and you're going to say, because you told me to, I'm not going to. I'm asking you to. I'm not telling you. Please go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. Where did the gold come from? The men that the Magi brought. Where did it come from? But what city? Babylon. Babylon. It was cruising to what city? Where, where was it going? Bethlehem. And then they were going to use that money to go where? To Egypt. And then God said he called him out of Nazareth. And he's going to, they're going to use that money to go to Nazareth. And do you see how this gold and frankincense is actually providing a way forward for them to travel? And God's resources were where? For all this to happen, where was his resources? They were sitting in Babylon, far, far away. Where's your resources for you today when you have need? The answer is we don't know. We would have never drawn up a plan like this. But I ask you where the gold came from. And I want you to look, John chapter 1. What does the Bible say? In the beginning was the Word, and here's capital W means Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. And Jesus is God, church, to the glory of God. He's God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things, including the gold that the wise man brought to baby Jesus, was made by Jesus. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So where did the gold come from? He made it. It was belonged to whom? Jesus. And then they, they, they stored up some of it in Babylon because he's got places all over the world where it's, there's more prevalent than others. And then when they found it, they process it and they, they bring it to baby. What are they bringing him? His own stuff back. You ever somebody bring your stuff back and say, here, here's your gift. You ever anybody wrap something up that was yours and they bring it back to you and say, here's your gift. You're like, man, come on, quit that cheeky mess. That's cheeky business, right? had a British friend once, cheeky, devilish. If somebody gives you your own gift back, like if you borrow a tool from somebody and you take it back to your neighbor and put a bow around it, here's your, gift, here's your wrench back. It's a little rusty. That's not very good neighborly business, is it? These men from Babylon were bringing whose resources? They were bringing Jesus back his own resources. But they were brought about with their heart. What was he what was after? The gold? The frankincense or myrrh? Which one's better? The answer is... Yes. What was Christ after when he ever he had this plan, this master plan? What was he after? Their gold, 
their frankincense, their myrrh, or their heart? What was he after? He was after their heart. What do you think this Christmas he's after in your heart and your life? Your job, that good paying job, he gave it to you. The skills that you have, that the ability to comprehend and understand, he gave that to you. That retirement that you own, he gave that to you. Those cars that you have, he gave that to you. That house that you live in, he gave that to you. Listen, can you not bring something to the Lord this season and say, Lord, I know you made all of this. You made the wood and the trees. You made the rocks, the gems, the gold. I'm offering you some of my treasures that you've given me. I want to give it back to you this season, and I want to praise your name. Who needs another pair of socks? We might do, right? That's what I ask for every season. I know it's coming. I have socks, some underclothes. It's every season. So the need is there. But guess where the supply comes from? I'll tell you straight up. Listen, where does my supply come from? It comes from you. If you give to this church, you pay my salary. Did you know that? But guess where your salary comes from? Some of you work for the government. I, I pay taxes, so I pay for your salary. But where do we all get it from? Lord Jesus Christ. It's all his. Everything that you have, everything that you have is his. I'm going to beg you this season, be like the wise man. Be a wise man. Be a wise woman. Be a wise child. And if you get gifts... If the Tooth Fairy, if you play that game, listen, if the Tooth Fairy comes and brings you, they've given more money, by the way. Tooth Fairy's up, up in the ante. It used to be a quarter when I was a kid. I don't know if you get 2.5 cents, but every, when we were little, my mom and dad always made sure that we had a nickel or a quarter or something to give to the Lord's work at church. Every Sunday, we had a coin to give and took up a collection in Sunday school, except for the Sunday I swallowed the nickel, and that's a different story for a different day. <clears throat> I was warned, don't do it, and mom was getting ready, and I... I jumped the Grand Canyon. Evil can evil jump the Grand Canyon, and he didn't make it. He ended up in my intestines. Here's the deal. Teach your children to give because it's the Lord's. But learn from yourself to give because it's the Lord's. I'm telling you, you want to be set free this Christmas? Quit giving silly gifts to each other. Quit giving gifts that are just random. Just got to buy one more. Oh, I need to buy. I got that, kid, uh, that person five things. I bought that person five things. I got to buy this person five things. That's silliness and foolishness. Come down where you actually say, listen, is there a need? Let's meet that need as best we can. But let's meet a need because the Lord, the gospel has got to be given out. And that's where we, we meet a need here at Town Creek Baptist Church. And then around the world, a lot of Christmas offering, all the different offerings that we have, we meet those needs. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, Lord, we know that the wise men were wise, not because they were just educated men, but because they had a heart and a mission to reach the Messiah, to reach the King of the Jews, to reach Jesus Christ. And we were there. They didn't spend your money along the way because it was a long way to come. They didn't spend your money on return. They didn't save some. They gave you everything, and they bowed their knee, and they worshiped you with their offering of their hearts first. And, Lord, we read, their hearts came first. Their knees were bowed first. Then they presented their gifts. And, Father, I think so many times a day in our hearts, we're too prideful. We don't bow our knee because we don't want to see other people to see us weak or feel like we're less than. And, Father, we are weak, and we are less than because you're the great you're the great physician, you're God, we're not. Father, teach us, break us, break our hearts. And Lord, let us, you tell us even in Malachi 3.10, test me now and see if I don't open the windows of heaven. Pour out a blessing on you that you can't restore it, that you can't hold it. When we bring all the tithes into your storehouse, Father, you provide here and around the world for your word to go forth. Lord, help us, I pray in Jesus' name, for his sake, amen.